In this video, I'll be taking you through the principles of portacath placement and management. In many of the previous videos, we talked about the various therapies that a medical oncologist uses systemically through the blood vessels, including chemotherapy, targeted therapies, and immunotherapies. And for gastroesophageal cancer, for the most part, that means placement of a portacath. What is a portacath? A portacath is a central IV that is placed uh, by an interventional radiologist using X-ray imaging called fluoroscopy to guide the procedure. They make incisions in the skin to place the portacath, and the blood vessels involved are veins called the internal jugular vein, the subclavian vein, and the superior vena cava. And the access point is then underneath the skin after it heals up. And as I'll show you in the next uh, slide, that a nurse can palpate this bump and access it with a needle to draw blood or to infuse uh, fluids or therapies. After the procedure, which is a day procedure, you go to the center, you get local anesthetic, and then you go home when it's finished. Um, it could be a little sore once the anal uh, analgesics wear off, the local anesthetic. And so oral over-the-counter Tylenol is usually sufficient to um, abide that pain until it wears off. Why do we use portacaths? Well, we are all familiar with peripheral IV lines, um, and they are useful for short-term uh, things, but in the setting of getting therapy for gastroesophageal cancer, where therapies are uh, intermittent every couple of weeks, and for a specific duration of time, and in the metastatic setting pretty much indefinitely, peripheral IVs are not the right way to go because they need to be replaced every few days. Um, there are central lines, therefore, that are placed, and you can see different types of central lines. Some of them are placed um, and, and are longer, like in the arm or a pick, a perfectly inserted central line. And um, in, for the most part, these are not used for uh, our intentions when we're, we're doing treatment uh, because a porticath is much more convenient because it's up in the chest, it's not affecting your arm, and so your daily activities are not affected. Um, and the other advantage is that they, once placed, they can last there for several years on, on the order of five to seven years. So the reasons then are just convenience and an alternative to, to having a peripheral IV placed and removed every time you need to get a blood draw or treatment. But in addition to that, specific chemotherapies really require the port. And those therapies include um, 5-FU, which we talked about in the principles of chemotherapy. 5-FU degrades very rapidly in the blood. And so we need to have a continuous infusion of 5-FU going into the body. And, and so um, with various regimens, that infusion is either 24 hours, say with FLOT, or 48 hours with full fox. In addition to that, there are chemotherapies like oxaliplatin, which could be administered in a peripheral IV, but upon administration and going up your arm, it can burn. And so a central IV placed in a larger blood vessel avoids that. And so again, for convenience and for some specific chemotherapies, a port is really what is required. Uh, in addition to that, porticats carry a lower risk of infection than other IV methods, and uh, that's an advantage. Although I'll show you in a moment, there are risks, and one of those is that it can become infected. Uh, they're, they're pretty easy to care for once they're placed, and, and people generally find that they're simple to care for at home. Um, upon accessing, as you can see on the right here, the nurse will clear, clean this up with a topical disinfectant, and then access the port. And then this port will remain accessed as such until the therapy is completed. And then, um, for example, with full Fox with 5-FU, you would go home with the port accessed and connected to the 5-FU pump. And then when it's completed, you would either go back to the center to get it removed, or in some cases, nurses come to the home to disconnect it, upon which the needle is removed. And then we go back to having just a little bump under the skin and until the next time it's going to be used. Again, as I mentioned, these porticats can stay there for some time and, and on the order of years. It is an advantage that it can be hidden under clothing and, and not noticeable. 
So there are different types of ports. There are, of course, the original single lumen uh, port, which has the access port for just one needle. Um, in oncology, when we're treating patients, we really do prefer a double lumen port where we can have different uh, things being administered like fluids in one and therapy in the other, for example. So that is the preferred uh, type of port. In addition to that, there are specialized uh, ports called power ports that are strong enough to withhold the, the pressure of injections that we use when we get CT scans that inject dye. And again, because we're doing repeated CT scans intermittently every few months, a power port is really preferred because then you can just use your port to, to get a CAT scan as opposed to having a port but not being able to use it for the dye and needing to get a peripheral IV inserted. So again, for convenience going forward, a power port really is, is desirable because it will allow for any form of therapy, blood draws, infusions, as well as CT scans. So as I was mentioning, nothing that we do comes with a zero risk, and there are some risks with a port, and that includes some infections locally in the skin around the insertion site can be infected um, and need topical antibiotics or oral or IV antibiotics. Um, in addition to that, more concerning would be an infection that becomes systemic. And so an infection in the port that then starts to seed into the bloodstream called bacteremia or bloodborne infections, bacterial infections or fungal infections that would need to be treated uh, with antibiotics that are given IV, usually through that port to help treat the port. It's some types of infections we would be required to remove the port and other types of infections can be treated through the port and the port left in place. And then the other main risk factor um, that comes along with having a port are blood clots. We talked about that um, earlier in a video where blood clots are common in cancer and can develop around a porticath. Um, in many cases, these are not symptomatic and they're just found on routine imaging while we're doing CT scans to see what the status of the cancer is on treatment. And then the radiologist notes that there is a blood clot that's formed on the port. Alternatively, sometimes they can be actually symptomatic. They can be painful or tender, cause swelling, redness in the area. They can lead to swelling in the arm on the side where the port is or the neck where the side where the port is. And ultimately blood thinners would be used to treat that or if it's severe or if the port um, is thought to not be needed at that point could be actually removed. An important thing to consider is flushing. Flushing is a term that's used to describe the maintenance procedure for making sure that a port remains free of clots and blockages, and it also prevents complications, infections. And so whenever it's first accessed, the first thing to do is to flush it. And then after whatever the intention of accessing the port is completed, whether it's a blood draw or uh, in treatment or a CT scan, then it would be flushed again before it's deaccessed. Flushing is usually with a normal saline solution and sometimes also with blood thinners. Uh, the recommendation in terms of how frequent a uh, port should be flushed, it should be flushed every time it's used. But if it's not being used regularly, sometimes our therapies are every four weeks or every six weeks. Um, and sometimes after completion of all therapies, say in the perioperative setting, after all curative intent therapy is completed, we leave the port there in place for some time. and in that setting, usually a minimum of every three months or so, uh, it needs to be flushed. And so this again will prevent blood clots and infections. Other considerations about a port, um, most people can maintain a full and active life after it's placed. In other words, you can shower, you can go swimming, as, of course, as long as it's not accessed at the time. And um, another consideration you can find online um, that you can make uh, something called a porticath pillow, where it's essentially it's a pad that can be placed on the seatbelt to prevent irritation of the port, because often when you're sitting in the car, it, the seatbelt comes right across where the port is. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, after curative intent therapy, a common question is how long do I have to keep this port in? And um, Generally speaking, in my opinion, in my practice, I would leave it there for about a year um, prior to removing it just to see how things are going and also because you're still getting blood draws, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so um, it's important to remember that during this time that it really needs to be flushed to a minimum of every three months. On the other hand, in the setting of stage four cancer with palliative intent therapy, usually that's left in place there indefinitely unless there's a need to take it out, like for example, a blood clot or an infection. So in this brief video, uh, we went through the principles of porticath placement, the reasons for having a port, the management and some other things to consider. Thank you.